our head of commercial mortgage and property, Mr. Stu, I can't say your surname, I'm not even going to attempt it. And uh, and Tom Floodgate, who's our asset finance man. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the market and sort of a bit of, we'll go back to basics a little bit. So what is asset finance and a little bit about commercial mortgage, how, how to spot opportunities. Um, and yeah, just a bit of a general chat. So please be as active. Oh, chat is disabled. Nana, please can you enable the chat if you know how to do that. Nana? As you can see, we're a very well-oiled machine. Uh, but anyway, so we're going to, yes, this is, uh, hi, Michael. Thank you. The chat is working. Um, so this is um, uh, an event specifically for some of our paid advisors. So thank you so much for, for your ongoing support. And this is just a bit of a, a bit of a thank you. We're going to be doing these in, on a little bit more regular basis. Um, and sorry that I've got the cat, cat behind me. Um, yeah, so a bit of, bit of a chat about what's going on in the market today um, and how you can basically spot and support your clients on secured lending, which is becoming in my opinion, more and more important right now. So um, that's my little introduction. Stu, over to you. What do you do? Who are you? And why should people listen to you? Morning, everyone. Um, my name's Stuart Bavalchik. I head up the commercial mortgage and property finance team at Swoop. Um, we're a relatively small team. There's, there's five of us, but there's a wealth of experience within that team. And we focus on five key product areas. Those being uh, primarily owner-occupied commercial mortgages. So where a trading business owns its premises, we'll, we'll secure them finance against that property. Uh, we do uh, a fair bit of commercial investment property. So those that are leased to, to third-party tenants and we support property investors in that. Uh, we do quite a bit of property portfolio lending. So that's primarily buy-to-let portfolios and can be mixed property as well. So um, some commercials thrown in there too. Uh, and we do a bit of bridging and development finance as well. Um, and one area where our support is often needed is in the semi-commercial market because your traditional banks can't pigeonhole um, whether it's residential or commercial when there's a dual use of a property on the same title, um, but there are wealth and lenders in the market that, that specialise in that space. So that's sort of in a nutshell who we are, what we do and the product offering that we have. Thank you. I'll dig a little deeper in a second, but thanks for the introduction. Tom, who are you? And basic question, but what is asset finance? So asset finance is essentially uh, any facility in which you're securing funds against a uh, or an asset that is not uh, a secured facility, i.e. What, what Stu's team would offer. Um, what I mean by that is there is no formal um, debenture registered. However, the funds will be connected and secured against the actual title of the equipment. First question was, who are you? I'm Tom Floodgate, um, and I look after uh, a lot of the asset finance uh, at Sweep. Awesome. And um, so th this is a bit of a question to both of you. I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot more inquiries from an asset finance point of view and from a, from a commercial mortgage problem point of view why why is it so important right now with 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 interest interest rates flying up and we're expecting another hike in the next in the next couple of weeks potentially up to five five six percent why why is secured lending um or, or, or lending against an asset why is that becoming more and more important for businesses do you want me to start that one tom yeah for it first um at a time where you know uh, if you look at a multitude of businesses and if they own their premises, one of their biggest costs and one of their biggest outgoings will be their premises costs. Um, be that whether they they lease them and they operate from, from property owned by a, by a separate landlord or be that that they own their premises and they have a mortgage on it. Um, there's lots of things that are spiraling out of control at the moment um, to a degree. You could argue that, that the finance market is too, which we've seen some lenders shut their doors over the last 24 hours purely in the investment space because of the concern with rising interest rates um, and, ha and having to review their products. But there are elements that you can control. You know, your, your utility bills, we've seen how they've skyrocketed and we've seen how the increase in the national living wage, you know, these are things which are imposed upon SMEs and businesses. The one thing that they can control 
is their mortgage payments if they review them regularly. So there's a real opportunity there that when everything else is sort of spiraling out of control and it's it's not within the SME's power to, to rein it back in again, well, if look at the ones that you can control and your mortgage payments are one of those. So sim- I'll come on to you in a second, Tom, but Steve, simple question for, for the accountants out there. What can they do? What can they be doing? What what sort of conversations can they be starting to to get them to be thinking about how they can support from a from a commercial mortgage point of view or spot opportunities where they might be able to free up some cash flow or do something a little bit different? I think there's a multitude of options. So it's it's taking the time to understand the business and what they currently have. Um, uh, a really good conversation starter is is usually at the annual account stage when. The balance sheet is being prepared. What liabilities are there outstanding by the business? Um, and, and what liabilities do they have? And is there a way of restructuring those to improve cash flow? If there is significant cash drain on the business, have a conversation with us and we'll see what we can do because it may not be that a commercial mortgage is the answer. That may be a part of the answer. And that's where Swoop adds a lot more value in the market to SMEs is that we have a commercial mortgage team, we have an asset finance team, we have an unsecured loans team, we can look at invoice finance. So it's about providing a tailored solution based on the client's needs. Say hello to the cat again, everyone. Okay. Um, so there's, there's, it, it's, and we're not tied to any particular lender, which is a real key thing for accountants to remember, is that we will work the whole market to get the right thing for the client. We act in the client's interest. So we're very much part of, of your team or an extension of your business because we all know how important your clients are to you so we'll make sure that we handle them with that due care and professionalism to to provide a solution that is right for them the one thing having been an ex-banker and it's the reason why i am an ex-banker is that when you are an employee of a bank your your primary remit is to protect the interests of the bank not service the client first whereas what we do is very much the other way around but in terms of spotting those opportunities, I think it's yeah, balance sheet review, what's on there, debt schedule. Um, the one thing that the accounts will never tell you is if the asset is owned outside in a different legal entity. So whether they own the property personally, whether they hold it in a SIP. But even if they do, there's ways and means that we can tie those back together with the trading business to use the asset as a solution to, to either restructuring or, or refinancing existing debts. Cool. Great. Great answer. Thank you. That's, I think it's quite enlightening. Please feel free to ask any questions as, as, as we go on. And um, Tom, just on the on the asset finance side, over the last couple of years, asset finance has actually been a bit quieter, hasn't it? Because of the the, the government support. Actually, C bills and RLS were used quite often to buy assets rather than the sort of traditional asset finance model. Are we seeing a bit of a rebound in in traditional, more traditional asset finance lending? Yeah, certainly. So I think when when the Siebel start first first surfaced, um, there were a lot of options that were available for Siebel's HP facilities, um, and obviously as as we all know and uh, were very prominent in the market with the Siebel's loans. Now, first of all, the Siebel's HP because of the um, subsidised interest from the government, they were running at the same rate as the loans. Um, the the loans themselves were being used to fund all soft assets. Why pay a soft asset price when you can just get a Siebel's loan? Um, and then, yeah, more recently, the, the RLS scheme um, that was uh, attached to, to, to HP facilities was was taken up by a lot of a lot of lenders and was offered by a lot of lenders and was taken up by a lot of clients and was also it was in itself was sort of reminiscent of the old EFG scheme. Um, in effect, it was just an additional guarantee that was going to be put on by the government and they were going to charge the clients more. So if there was a, a, a way of getting them onto a, a straightforward HP over that RLS time, then yes, of course, we would love to do that. But there were, like you mentioned, you know, a lot of uptakers on the, on the RLS as well, simply because of the benefits of having the additional uh, strength and, and guarantee added by the government. And that is both to the lender and the client. More recently, yeah, I think, the, the, the market has gone back to um, your more traditional HP and finance lease facilities. Um, the the in terms of your earlier question, the, the benefit of doing it on a on an asset finance facility as opposed to a, a an unsecured loan, for example, is that you're securing the funds against the equipment, which gives the lender that additional security, which ultimately drives the rate down. Now, 
that additional security in the form of a, a Siebel's guarantee or an RLS guarantee is what we're driving the rates down through COVID. Um, because in the sense of the Siebel's and the security of the asset, that's why things were so cheap. Um, at the moment, we're seeing rates creep up because as we all know, the base rate is going up. Um, but a lot of lenders, they are in competition with each other. It is, there is, a, there is a big, big market out there of lenders. So they, they know themselves that they can't take it too far um, because obviously, you know, they, they will have levels that they need to take it to. They will need to increase their rates, yes. But if they're just doing it and increasing them ridiculously for the sake of it, everyone's going to go to the competition instead. So, yeah, in answer to your question, the, the, there was an uptake. Yes, the market has gone back to, to how it used to be. Yes. Um, and we are still finding that lenders are being as competitive as they can be given the current climate. Question for both of you then. So if you can secure asset against a prop, sorry, if you can secure finance against a property or against an asset, does that mean you don't have to take a personal guarantee? Not, not in asset finance, no, um, not necessarily anyway. Um, the guarantee is obviously additional strength and will be requested by a lender on the strength of the application. If we're getting you know, good, solid companies and good hard assets, the chances are we're not gonna need a guarantee because the security is, is already there. The serviceability is shown. More often than not, the assets will create their own serviceability and will service their own agreements. On top of that, you've got the strength of the business being able to repay. If that wasn't the case, a guarantee kind of becomes irrelevant however on a soft asset or a slightly um weaker credit facility the yeah then yes they they may be required Stu, do you want to interject on the secure yeah um the commercial mortgage side of it isn't quite straightforward <laughs> there's there's many variables that will impact whether a personal guarantee is taken or not now there are some lenders who take a purely commercial view and will lend if it's in a limited company and everything's tidy in one limited company, they will lend to that company and they won't take a PG. Um, however, um, there are instances where some lenders, as a matter of their credit policy and credit criteria, they look to take a personal guarantee. If they do, we work with lenders and clients to try and limit that as much as possible. Um, scenarios where PGs are often required are when we do a commercial mortgage against the going concern value of the business rather than the bricks and mortar value of the property that it trades from. So to use an example as a, as a care home, it's going concern value could be one and a half million pounds and that's what it sells at. The property value could be as little as half a million quid depending on where it's located in the country. Now we will get a lender to lend against the one and a half million value rather than the bricks and mortar value, but they will usually take some form of PG for that bit in the middle where they are lending against the goodwill. Um, but that's where the knowledge and experience of the team comes in to look to work those solutions and provide options to a client, not just say, here's your deal. It's here's your options and talk to them what those various options look like and talk them through them. Um, one thing to always be mindful of as, as, as well when PGs are concerned is the ability to take out PG insurance. So if it is something that's insisted on by a lender, then as, as an SME as a, or as a property professional, how can you manage that risk? You manage it by paying for a PG insurance. So, and that's again, something that, that we can help with at Swig. Typically, how much does PG insurance, I know it's not cheap, roughly how much does PG insurance cost? Uh, I'll be honest, it's quoted on a bespoke basis, depending on the client, the profile, what's in the background. So yeah, it's very much client driven. It's um, yeah, asking what an average life cover premium is, it's yeah, it's a tough one to answer. Um, but but where there is the possibility to negotiate away those PGs, then we always do that for a client because, as I touched on earlier, we work in their best interests as much as we can. Cool. Next question. I'm I'm expecting fairly different answers from the both of you, but we're we're probably heading into a recession. It seems like that's fairly fairly inevitable. It's going to happen. I feel like this recession is slightly different. Than the last recession in 2008 2009 because the funding landscape for me is completely completely different to what it was back then steve for you first a high street bank still going to be lending from a commercial mortgage point of view going into the recession or is it the challenger banks and the and everyone else that's going to be stepping up um tom made a really good point on this earlier is that it's a very competitive market 
and the there's never been so many options in the finance market which is great so the lessons learned from the from from the last recession in 07 08 to where we are today that diversification and, and improvement in the market has actually helped provide more options wonderful but those options need to be competitive with each other and to continue trading as a business they need to be lending money so they've got to get cash out the door one of the major differences in in um I like to call it the most talked about recession that's never been yet, is that the, this will not be driven by a lack of liquidity. There's plenty of liquidity in the market. However, we're already seeing ripples following the latest base rate increase last week, coupled with the, the I keep putting it in inverted commas, the mini budget, because it was hardly mini. Um, the, the, the implications off the back of that has cause swap rate, swap rates to go wild in the market. Therefore, that gives that tier two and that tier three market on the property side, lots of uncertainty. How do they price a deal now? Because they haven't got the visibility on it. So that's where we've seen some lenders over the last sort of 24, 48 hours, particularly in that investment space, take a backward step. But the long and short of it is if you've got a good business, you've got good people that are strong, have experience at what they do, have a good asset base, there's a deal to be done there. There's all, there, there is always going to be a deal to be done. Now, whether that sits with your tier one banks, your tier two banks, or or your your more um, specialist lenders and the specialist market, that's why we run a process with that market to get them the best, get a client the best terms that we can. Um, so I think whilst there are going to be certainly many headwinds that that we're going into, I think those operators that are savvy and the the, the better quality SMEs. It's a capitalist market that we live in. You've, there's got to be a cutoff at some point. And I think we're getting to that point now where we are going to lose the bottom 10% of the market and we go again. So it's, it's a natural cycle that we go through. But if you look at, you know, there's, there's been a lot of challenges in a relatively short period of time. Um, certainly in, in my career in financial services, there's, there's still things that I'm seeing for the first time. Last week, five-year fixed rates were cheaper than two-year fixed rates. It's the first time I've ever seen that in my career. Um, there's a war going on. We've had COVID. You know, everything thrown into the melting pot. There will be headwinds. But if you position yourself accordingly, you're not overgeared. You operate sensibly. You've taken steps to, to increase your revenue, which is partly driving inflation. But to absorb those increasing costs, you're driving the top line. If we're doing all of those relatively basic things, then... The, the, the probability of coming out smelling the roses on the other side is significantly higher. Same question to you, Tom. Is 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 it from an asset finance point of view? Is this a is this a high street market, or is this is this the challenges that are going to be taking this? Um, it's a good question. I would say it was both. Um, purely on the basis that the the, the lenders, much like Stu alluded to, the lenders are always going to need to lend money out in, in order to survive as businesses. That is that is their, their main business activity. What I think we'll see is we will see the we will see the, the appetite tightening up. So your, your high street banks, you know, your tier ones, your, your, your stricter credit will be able to, to, as they naturally are anyway, but they will have the luxury of being more picky over what they do and don't lend against and who and who they do and don't lend to. Um, what that means is obviously it's, it's still a benefit to them because they are still going to operate. They will still lend. You know, we saw it through the last through the through the COVID lull. You know, there, there was still an appetite there for lending, albeit a little bit stricter and a little bit more tight underwriting wise. In terms of the challenger banks, of course, they only get the benefits of that because the stuff that is dropping down that would have been tier one, you know, 18, 24 months ago, is now becoming tier one and a half, tier two, and so on and so forth. So yes, the bottom end of the market for asset will probably drop out as well. Um, but there will still be lenders out there that are actively looking to lend. There will still be um, homes for, for for these customers. And in reality, nowadays, if we're going from a, from a tier one to a, a tier two, the increase in rate comparatively isn't that high. And we need to look at it realistically. You know, when we're funding these assets, these assets are something like I've alluded to already that that service their own income and service their own agreements. Now, if they are going to generate an income that's somewhat higher than the interest rate, which of course it will be, otherwise it would be fairly pointless looking to put them on a facility in the first place. 
if you reduce that that profit margin by one percent yes it's not ideal it's money that's better in the customer's client than the lenders but it probably won't make that a non-viable option for the vast majority of clients they are still able to fund it they are still able to make profit out of that machine and ultimately you know use that equipment to increase their revenue and and drive their business forwards through the recession for, for accountants that might want to be managing the expectations of their clients and the sort of rates they might be getting in both of your in both of your worlds i know this changes on a daily basis given the rates are, are, are changing so frequently but what what is the typical and, it, and obviously it depends how how long is a piece of string all that sort of stuff but like what's a typical range of interest rates you'd expect for for a decent business well, interestingly enough, it's it, it's the highest I've ever seen them at the moment. Um, and I've been doing this for about six and a half years. Um, I would say at the moment for a really good, strong business, you're looking at upwards of 4% flat, which is around about 8% 8 APR. Um, and that can range anything up to 10, 11, 12% flat. Anything more expensive than, than that, I don't really think that lenders will go to because that's when you're tapping on the... Uh, Unsecured loan market. Same question. Yeah, on the depends on sort of the product category. So your portfolio lends where it's primarily residential property. Lenders can still be quite aggressive in that market, and we're seeing fixed rates at around four and a half, five percent. So not too different to your sort of residential market, your vast residential market. For owner-occupied commercial, um, we had what we would deem a vanilla deal the other day, long established business, trading very, very well, um, just looking to refinance existing debt. And we got a margin of 1.65 over base with Lloyds Bank, which is very punchy. Um, commercial investment property, um, sorry, coming back onto trading. So that, that was 1.65 over base. We, we see them as high as four or five over base, dependent on what the risk profile of that, that client and that business is um straight commercial property that's where we've seen the biggest hikes in in margins and rates um we're probably looking at a pay rate at the minute of circa seven percent in that space um and that that can sort of fluctuate up and down again dependent on risk profile so there's a there's a very mixed bag on on our side of the fence but again i'll bring it back to that main point is that's exactly why we run a process with the market so we can disclose to a client what the options are and we are always of when we position those options with clients cheapest doesn't always necessarily mean the best because when we are lending to a trading business lenders invariably will want some form of covenants as part of their security suite or their um as or as part of their facility now are you better off paying an extra half a percent to have no covenants or are you going to chase the rate and have a, a couple of a4 pages list of covenants where the bank's essentially running your business Again, that's where proper conversation needs to be had around that. Stu, we had a bit of misinformation recently uh, that we heard that had been given to a couple of accountants. Um, where a, where a, 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 a business owner owns a property personally and rents it back to the business, how, how does that become a commercial mortgage uh, opportunity and what, and what is it you can do in it? I would say 90% plus of the deals that we do for trading businesses, commercial mortgages for trading businesses, are on that structure. So it's most commonly known as an opco propco structure. Um, you'll have an operating company and a, and a property company. Now, the property company doesn't necessarily need to be a limited company. It can be Mr. and Mrs. Smith owning the pub in their name, but they trade it through the Lord Nelson Limited. Now, the way that we tie those together, we can lend to either entity. So we could either lend to the limited company and the way that we would wrap that security in to do it as an owner-occupied mortgage would be to take a personal guarantee from Mr. and Mrs. Smith, supported by a first legal charge over the property, but we lend to the company. So the security suite is a PG back by the property. Alternatively, we lend to Mr. and Mrs. Smith, but then take a corporate guarantee from the Lord Nelson, I think it was, Lord Nelson Limited, in favour of them so we can use the cash flow that's generated by the business to service the debt so it's a pretty simple mechanism of using guarantees to cross collateralize the security with the borrowing entity um, and by doing it that way you classify it as a as an owner occupied commercial mortgage the benefits of doing that 
is that you'll typically get lower margins. As I just touched on the margins point and the rates point, you will get lower margins on owner-occupied commercial mortgages than you will do on investment property. Um, there are a lot of um, intermediaries in the market that try and do that as an investment mortgage through the back door. And it's not the right way to do it because it's not in the client's best interest. But again, that's where the knowledge and experience of our team comes to the fore to, to provide those options for clients. Thank you. Question, I'm just conscious of time, we don't have too long. We'll let people start their day properly. But question to both of you, how important is the, is the accountant's role in a, in a funding application? Massive. Um, we, to do, to do our job properly for clients, for SMEs and property professionals, having the data and the information to have is integral and as up-to-date as possible. And that's where accountants can play a vital role. Um, and with any transaction, um, we do tend to fund a lot of acquisitions. So we will be involved with the accountant if it's a share purchase as part of the due diligence process. Now, working closely with the accountants, we create a deal team. At the moment, the market is quite volatile. So now, more than ever, communication is key to make sure that these deals stay on track and get done in a, in a satisfactory, satisfactory manner and a timely manner. Now, by working together with accountants to achieve that, with clients, with solicitors, again, they're a key component to make sure that clear line of communication continues to get the deal transacted and overplay. Anything to add, Tom? Uh, I, yes and no. I think for me, it helps because to write a proposal, an asset finance credit proposal for a company, we need to have a, a level of understanding of that business. Um, I personally like that as well because it means that I understand a little bit more about what it is I'm doing, i.e. what we're applying for. And having the advisor involved, it, it gives us someone to ask about the ins and the outs of the financials. You know, in a lot of cases, clients, they're just focused on running their business. You know, that's what, the, that's what their accountants are there for, is to help them with the financial side. Sometimes, you know, going through things with the with the actual advisor, the accountant themselves, it, it gives us a better response, it gives us a better insight, and it, it ultimately makes my life easier. They're great, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and what, uh, just a final couple of questions, what, for, again, for both of you, what industries are you seeing most frequently come, coming to you with inquiries about commercial mortgage asset finance? Are there, are there any particular industries that you see more frequently than others, or is it just general? No, we see we see a really mixed bag. Um, the 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 vast majority that we do see tends to be owner occupied trading businesses. So that's things like care homes, children's day nurseries, pubs, restaurants, hotels. Um, we've seen a fair few manufacturing businesses, um, particularly on the manufacturing front, where they've outgrown their current premises and they might be looking to to build something that's purpose built for themselves and to future proof the business. Um, seen a fair bit in retail so it is very very broad um but again the the team that we have has knowledge in in a lot of different areas and we'll make sure that they're any client that needs support in in a certain sector we've got somebody that that knows and understands that sector to work with them Doc? yeah similar um we the inquiries we receive are from from all types of, of industries um i think all industries are always going to have requirements which they need to fund Obviously, the assets differ. Um, you know, we are looking at a wide range of things from digital printers through to, you know, electric cars, vans, diggers themselves. Um, so there's always going to be a, a mixed bag of what it is we're actually funding. Um, but in terms of the industries, actually, you know, that's that's varied as well. There's, there's never one specific type um, and lenders will always have appetite to lend against assets that are going to have strong residual value in, in three, four, five years time. Final question, if any, anyone listening can take one action away to you know, support their clients a little bit further in your, in your area, have you got any, any particular action you, you would like them to take or, or like them to see doing within the client base? I think you guys know my favourite question by now <laughs> from various internal chats, um, but, but one for accountants is um, do you, will you or do you aspire to own the property that your business trades from? If the answer to that question is yes, then get them in front of us and we'll talk through what, what options are available to them. Because if it's somebody that's renting and they're paying 50 grand a year in rent, do you know what? We might be able to fund that at close to 100% loan to value. 
but reduce their costs and they'll end up owning the asset. Um, if somebody's got an existing mortgage, again, that question stimulates, right, what's there in the background? Can we have a conversation about it and see what you're up to? So, yeah, do you, will you, or do you aspire to own that property that your business trades from is the key one for me. Thank you, Tom. Mine's very simple. It's um, very simply, are you looking at buying anything in the next few months? If the answer is yes, you know, what is it you're buying? What is it for? What are you going to do with it? If the answer is no, well, what about for the rest of the year then? Um, it's just establishing um, what it is the client's going to need to 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 increase their their offering with, um, and just being on top of it when they are and making sure that we we're in a position to get some credit in place for them. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Just a, a shout out to anyone listening. Feel free to use us, abuse us, uh, and basically take us as a, an extension of your team. We're always happy to jump on calls, speak to your clients, and speak to you directly. Um, but yeah, as always, just reach out and um, happy to help. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Pleasure. Cheers, guys. Cheers, later. Cheers, all.